Welcome to Simple Health Radio, the podcast about recognizing medical emergencies and promoting wellness throughout your journey in life. Your host is Dr. Emran, a respected physician who's treated thousands of people just like you over the past 10 years. Listen to the show each week on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, and 3 and Out Radio Network. Information provided on this show is not a substitute for professional medical advice. Always discuss your questions with your doctor or go to your nearest emergency room immediately. Thank you so much for joining me today on Simple Health Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Emron. On today's episode, we have a very special guest. Her name is Stacia Dearman. She is an expert in medical malpractice, and she's going to talk with us today about some of the unique circumstances that occur with bad patient outcomes and lawsuits that involve physicians. So thank you so much, Stacia, for joining us today. Sure. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So tell us, Stacia, a little bit about your background, your training, and the work that you do currently. Well, I'm a physician. I practice in the state of Ohio, and my particular area of expertise is in pediatrics in the emergency environment. So I practice in a large children's hospital exclusively in the emergency department, and that's the sort of work that I've been doing for about 15 or 16 years. Okay, fascinating, fascinating. And then the reason I wanted to have you as a guest today is because we've never really talked about medical malpractice and lawsuits, but I do know that there is a very negative association that the general public has with doctors who are sued for any reason. And in my experience, I have found that many of the doctors who are actually involved in a lawsuit may not do anything wrong, but it's actually the family or the patient's impression or the conversation that went into a negative direction. So can you kind of back up a step and allow us to know what leads to a lawsuit and what typically occurs in those early phases? Sure. Well, I think, number one, you're absolutely correct. With the misconception to think that malpractice litigation only happens to bad physicians or physicians who are not providing state-of-the-art care. And I think it would also be a misconception to assume that where there is a bad outcome of necessity, a mistake was made and medical error was involved. That's certainly true in some cases, but certainly not in all. And I think, in fact, the more accurate reality might be to understand that where physicians are caring for patients whose situation involves some degree of medical complexity, there is that much greater likelihood that something will occur that surprises everyone, including the physician. I think that where make a shift from being a situation where something unfortunate has occurred to a situation where a lawsuit is filed. You know, that's a tricky question and really probably each case is its own story. But I think many times what happens is that at some point, perhaps the patient or the family is left feeling like they don't fully understand what happened and they're not comfortable or happy with the outcome. And so they look for some sort of remedy that they hope will either provide them with some sort of compensation for what's happened Or in some cases, I think people are looking perhaps to punish the physician or other healthcare providers who they felt let them down in some way. And at that point, things can make a shift from being an alliance between a physician and a healthcare providing institution and the patient to shifting into the mode of being an adversarial relationship. And I think that's when malpractice litigation typically arises. I understand. And I think that's a very good point that oftentimes physicians want to do what's in the best interest of the patient at that time, but perhaps there's miscommunication or misunderstanding. And when something derails or the treatment goes in a direction where the patient suffers in some way, even if they don't die or have some horrible complication, I think oftentimes those patients get advice from either family members or their attorneys or other people. And I think that leads them down a different pathway altogether. And I will say I have seen that before where a very good patient-doctor relationship can be disrupted and it can turn into not an enemy situation, but a very negative me versus them approach. 
And at that point, then the communication has broken down. I don't think you can fix or build a bridge at that point without a lot of effort. Is that consistent with what you've seen as well? Yeah, I think that's true. I think it can be very hard for the relationship to recover if it shifts into an adversarial mode. Uh, Because then people are afraid on both sides, right? And it's hard for us to communicate as human beings when fear is standing in our way. Sure, sure. And then tell us about some of the more common causes for lawsuits. Is it related to certain types of surgeries, certain medications, certain outcomes? Is there sort of a general category or two or three that you see oftentimes repeat itself? Well, I don't even know that we have really ideal data that would answer that question. I can tell you that the more common specialties among physicians to be named in a lawsuit are the surgical specialties. So I think the more procedurally based a specialty is, the more procedures they're doing, the greater is the risk that something surprising will happen. A complication will arise, for example, and that will prompt people to file a lawsuit. Does that make sense? It does. The groups less likely to be sued are at the other end of the spectrum, people whose work is more intellectually based. So physicians in psychiatry, pediatric, pathology, family medicine, where there's not necessarily a scalpel involved or a scalpel being applied to the patient anyway, those are the groups less likely to be sued. Although when they are sued, it's certainly devastating to them for that reason because they frequently, in many of those cases, have a long-standing relationship with their patient. Absolutely. Now tell us a little bit about the time frame. So, for example, if there's a bad outcome, let's say in January, and the family decides with an attorney on behalf of the patient to file a lawsuit, is this something that's rapidly resolved, like within a few weeks, or does it often drag out into months or even years based on your experience? It frequently drags out. So I would say the average is probably that a lawsuit, once it's filed, takes one and a half to two years to resolve. And I say once it's filed because it's not typically filed immediately after the adverse event occurs. It may even be six months or a year or sometimes considerably longer, depending upon the particular case and the statute of limitations that applies to the case, maybe considerably longer before the suit is filed at all. So it can be, for example, that a patient has an unexpected outcome. Let's say a patient dies unexpectedly in January of 2015, let's say. Maybe the suit is not formally filed until January of 2016, and maybe the proceedings drag on for another two or two and a half years and don't resolve then until maybe three, three and a half years after the original event occurred. So, and as you can imagine, the stress that provokes for everyone involved is enormous. And when I say everyone, I include the family members of that person who died. I think that there might be the impression that somehow working through this legal process will help people to process their grief and anger and disappointment. But I think in actuality, it probably prolongs it and makes it difficult for people to process their bereavement, sort of stalls them in it. I see. I see. And I think that's a very good point, is that the satisfaction, even at the end of all of this, if it does go to court, if there is a settlement, Oftentimes, the financial risks and benefits may not be what the people actually intended. And now, unfortunately, we have a large number of people on both sides who are very disrupted. And I have seen some doctors who are very, very good doctors involved in lawsuits. It actually changes the way they practice. It changes the way they think or approach patients, oftentimes in a very negative way. Is that something you've also seen later on, let's say five or 10 years after a lawsuit? where people actually change their behavior, even though they're very good professionals, they're now a little bit more vigilant or diligent in terms of how they approach things? Yes, I think that that's something that might be difficult for people outside the world of medicine or even physicians who've never been through it themselves to fully comprehend is what a deep impact it has on a physician. 
the data that we have now indicate that most American physicians are sued at some point in their career. And for many of them, it results in a lasting impact, everything from depression and anxiety to a form of post-traumatic stress that they experience in practice when they encounter patients with similar problems, for example. There are certainly physicians who retire early, and as you say, excellent physicians. So we all, as a society, lose the benefit of the skill they've developed, let's say, in safely delivering babies. They may leave behind their obstetric practice, or they may drift into other responsibilities in the world of medicine that don't entail clinical hands-on care. And in fact, just a few days ago, probably around August 29th or so of this year, National Public Radio released a segment on physician suicide in which they made the connection between the experience of unexpected patient outcomes and litigation and physician suicide, which we now know is at a much higher rate than we would like to see more than other professional groups. So I think that the losses physicians suffer at a professional and at a personal level as they traverse these very difficult experiences are much larger than people might realize. I think people may think physicians are able to compartmentalize this as well. It's just part of my work. I think actually most physicians are dedicated to the well-being of their patients, and we are also heartbroken when bad things happen to our patients. Absolutely. No, I would agree with you on that completely. Now, if people are in a situation where they face a lawsuit, what are some of the basic advice parameters that you give them? I've heard some people actually say, after you talk to your lawyer, you should talk to your chaplain or talk to your priest or talk to your psychologist. Just for those reasons that you mentioned about the anxiety and depression, is that something you have also seen in the cases that you've handled as well? I think that that is excellent advice. I think one of the most important things that a physician or any other healer who is confronting, let's even set aside litigation, let's say confronting just a terrible outcome that has really broken their heart. One of the most important things that they can do is to stop and look at who the people are who they can reliably draw around them as confidants and feel comfortable that those are safe confidants. In other words, those are people who are going to treat them with respect, hear their story, and completely respect their confidentiality, respect them as practitioners, and also are people who are not likely to be subpoenaed to testify in court about that conversation. So good example, you're hitting them right on the head. One is a clergy person or a spiritual advisor. That's a person that you can go to, and that is typically a protected conversation. Your lawyer, that is a protected conversation. Your own physician is generally someone with whom you can have a protected conversation. Your spouse or a very close family member would be a good example. And then also certain people within your work environment. So someone who represents your malpractice carrier, someone who represents quality improvement or quality assurance at your hospital, your risk manager, maybe your direct supervisor. I think being selective about who you want to talk this over with is important. Oh, and you certainly mentioned a psychologist. I can't be strongly enough to the benefit for a physician to starting early to speak with a psychologist or there are a small number of people. I'm building this sort of my practice myself who specifically do litigation stress management coaching. And that is also a type of relationship that is basically protected because you're not seeking to discuss so much the medical ins and outs of the case at hand. You're seeking to discuss your mental well-being. Excellent. So, yes, I think you're right. Starting early to seek care is just totally wisdom. (laughs) True. Very true. Well, thank you so much for clarifying that. Now, for our listeners today, even though not everyone on our show in the audience is a doctor or a nurse, if they know somebody or if they are involved in a situation like this, Can they connect with you directly or do they have to go through a website or some other resources in order to speak with you? 
Probably the easiest way to reach me is through my website because there's a contact.